In a game of chicken, where two players drive toward each other, and if both continue straight, they'll crash, there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria. If player one plays straight and player two plays swerve, then player one doesn't want to switch and get zero, and player two definitely doesn't want to switch and get minus 100. And the opposite outcome, where player two goes straight and player one swerves, is also a Nash equilibrium by similar reasoning. But it turns out that this game has a third Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. And in fact, there's a rule of thumb that almost all games have an odd number of Nash equilibria, and that rule of thumb can be formalized into a theorem, but the conditions on almost all are quite technical and complicated to prove, so we won't go into detail. But the upshot is, if you know that a game has two Nash equilibria, you should strongly suspect the presence of a third. And so in the case of chicken, we can solve for one player's probabilities that will make the other player indifferent between their two strategies, and therefore also willing to randomize. We express that indifference as the expected utility to player two of playing straight is equal to their expected utility from playing swerve. And each of those expected utilities depend on the probability with which player one randomizes between straight and swerve. When player two chooses straight, there's a probability p of ending up with minus 100, and a probability 1 minus p of ending up with utility 1. Whereas if player 2 plays swerve, there's a probability p that they get minus 1, and a probability 1 minus p that they get 0. And from here, we can simplify and solve for p. giving us p, the probability of going straight, equal to 0.01, which means the probability of swerve is 0.99. And since this game is symmetrical, meaning player 2 has the same incentives as player 1, if we solved for player 2's probabilities q and 1 minus q, we'd get exactly the same result. And so, when each player randomizes 1% straight and 99% swerve, we have a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. As we'll see later in the semester, this process of solving for the probabilities that give us a Nash equilibrium gets much more complicated as we add more players and strategies. And so an alternate problem that we'll often consider is instead of finding a Nash equilibrium from scratch, if we are given a candidate Nash equilibrium, checking that it does in fact satisfy the conditions. So if I had just told you that there was a mixed Nash equilibrium with these probabilities, you could confirm it by calculating each player's expected utilities and verifying that everyone is playing a best response. To do that, we'd start by calculating player one's utility for each of their actions, straight or swerve, against the proposed mixed strategy profile of their opponents. So if player two is playing 1% swerve and 99% straight, then that gives us a 0.01 chance of this outcome and a 0.99 chance of this one. And likewise for the expected value of swerve. And when we carry out these expected utility calculations, they both come out to minus 0.01. And the calculations for player two would be the same by symmetry. And so because each player is indifferent among the actions that they are randomizing between, and they don't have any other actions with a higher expected utility, every player is best responding, and so we verified that this profile is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. But at least for me, all three of the Nash equilibria of this game are somewhat unsatisfactory. None of them Pareto dominates the others, and each of them seems bad by at least one of our other social welfare criteria. 
The pure equilibria are bad on egalitarian grounds, because somebody is always getting a bad payoff of minus one. And the mixed equilibrium is bad on utilitarian grounds, because the total utility is lower, being dragged down by the chance of the crash outcome. But it turns out that cars crashing into each other is enough of a problem in modern society that we've developed a pretty ingenious solution. Namely, the traffic light. And if we slightly relabel the actions of this game, we see that this same payoff matrix can represent the familiar situation of two cars meeting at an intersection. And in this situation of two drivers deciding whether to go or stop at an intersection, the job of the traffic light is to coordinate their behavior so that we never end up in the both go outcome where they could crash, and that we alternate between the go stop and stop go outcomes. So we'd like to allow our game theoretic modeling to include this sort of coordination device, which leads us to the concept of a correlated equilibrium. We can formalize the idea of a coordination device as specifying some probability distribution over the outcomes of a game, and then telling each player when it draws from that distribution what action they're supposed to play. So if we represented the probability distribution of a traffic light, then it might put us half the time in the go-stop outcome and half the time in stop-go. And this coordination device would be a correlated equilibrium if every player is always best responding by doing what they're told. For the traffic light, that means if it gives you a green light, your best response is to go, whereas if it gives you a red light, your best response is to stop. In the mathematical model, that means when the coordination device tells player one that their action should be straight, player one now updates their belief. They know that if they were told to play straight, then under this probability distribution, the only possibility is that we're aiming for this outcome, and under that outcome, their best response is in fact to play straight like they were told. Likewise, when player two is told to play swerve, they know that the probability distribution over those outcomes is only going to put us in this outcome, and so having been told swerve, they believe that we are definitely in this outcome, to which their best response is, in fact, to play swerve. And this idea of a coordination device can open up a range of new correlated equilibria in a variety of games. In this Bach or Stravinsky game, where you and a friend want to go to a concert together, but your friend would rather see Bach while you would rather see Stravinsky, there are two pure strategy Nash equilibria and one mixed Nash equilibrium. And here, note that the asymmetry of the game, where you have a bigger preference for Stravinsky than your friend does for Bach, means that the equilibrium probabilities are different for the two players, but we can confirm that player one randomizing one-third, two-thirds, and player two randomizing three-fourths, one-fourth, is a Nash equilibrium, because each player is best responding. But once again, we have a situation where the pure Nash equilibria feel unfair. And in this case, the mixed Nash equilibrium is terrible. It's Pareto dominated by either of the pure equilibria. But if we had a coordination device, we could maybe achieve a more equitable mix of the two pure strategy equilibria. So here is a possible distribution over the outcomes that the coordination device might specify. And the advantage here of the coordination device is the joint randomization between the two players. The reason that the mixed Nash equilibrium for Bach or Stravinsky is bad is that each player is randomizing their strategy independently. 
But since the player's goal in this game is to coordinate their actions on one or the other of the concert options, when they randomize independently, that gives us a significant chance of a miscoordination. But the coordination device allows the two players to randomize in a way that is correlated, so there's some chance of either the Bach concert or the Stravinsky concert, but there's no chance of a miscoordination. And so under this coordination device specifying an 80-20 mix of those outcomes, if you're told to go to the Bach concert, then it's a best response to do so, because you know that your friend was also told to go to Bach, and if you were told to go to Stravinsky, then you know your friend was also told Stravinsky, and so your best response is to play what you were told. And so this distribution is a correlated equilibrium, but hopefully it's clear that there's nothing special about 80-20. I could have picked many other distributions over these two outcomes. Whether I said 50-50 or 90-10 or 100-0, it would still be a best response to play what the coordination device told you. So many games have a wide range of possible correlated equilibria. But it's also worth noting that correlated equilibrium isn't just about mixing between pure strategy Nash equilibria. And to see that, let's consider correlated equilibria in this variant of rock, paper, scissors. Here, I've modified the payoff matrix to rock, paper, scissors to make it so that the tie outcomes, rather than giving both players a payoff of zero, give both players a big negative payoff. So they really want to avoid those outcomes. But the only Nash equilibrium of this game is still for both players to randomize a third, a third, a third. And we can verify that by checking the expected utilities. And since all of the actions have the same expected utility, there's no beneficial deviation, and symmetry means the same calculations would apply for player two. And so the Nash equilibrium prediction here is that the players are going to get one of these bad outcomes a third of the time. So again, this is a great example where the players would like to coordinate their actions, but they can't just coordinate on one outcome like they could have in Bach or Stravinsky, because if we tried to coordinate on one outcome of rock, paper, scissors, there's always somebody who wants to switch to a different action. So instead, the correlated equilibrium has to coordinate on a randomization where even after updating beliefs, the players are still somewhat uncertain about which outcome will happen. If the coordination device places one-sixth probability on all of the non-tie outcomes, and places zero probability on the really bad outcomes, we can check whether this is in fact a correlated equilibrium by asking, is it always the case that the players are best responding when they play the action they were told to play? That means we need to check all possibilities of what might a player be told and what beliefs do they have after they are told that and are they best responding to those beliefs. We can start with the case where player one is told to play rock, and when that happens, player one deduces that we can't be in any of these outcomes, so when they update their belief, they determine that there's a 50% chance that the coordination device chose this outcome, and a 50% chance that it chose this outcome. So player one now reasons, if player two is following the coordination device, then I think there's a 50% chance they're playing paper and a 50% chance they're playing scissors. And I now need to look at the payoff matrix and figure out what is my best response against 50% paper, 50% scissors. So player one will calculate what's my expected payoff if I play rock or paper or scissors, 
when I think that the opponent is 50-50 between paper and scissors. If player 1 chooses rock, then the result will be a 50% chance of this outcome or this outcome. So they'll get minus 1 half the time and plus 1 half the time for an expected utility of 0. If player 1 plays paper, then they believe there's a 50% chance of this outcome or a 50% chance of this outcome, which means half the time they'll get minus 9 and half the time they'll get minus 1 for an expected utility of minus 5. And if they play scissors, then half the time they'll end up here and half the time here for an expected utility of minus 4. So when the coordination device tells player 1 to play rock, and they update their beliefs based on that information, ruling out any of the outcomes where they weren't told to play rock, and then player 1 calculates expected utilities, the best response available is to, in fact, play rock like they were told. To fully confirm that this distribution is a correlated equilibrium, we would also need to verify that when player 1 is told to play paper, they should do so, and when they're told to play scissors, scissors is a best response, and likewise, all of player 2's actions are best responses when the coordination device tells them to play that action. But all of those calculations would look fairly similar. And so this distribution over outcomes is in fact a correlated equilibrium of our no ties rock, paper, scissors. So we now have these two different ways of making predictions about how players will randomize their actions. In a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, each player randomizes their actions independently, while in a correlated equilibrium, there is a joint randomization that can be correlated between the different players. And this, of course, raises the question of which equilibrium concept should we apply to make predictions? In this no ties rock, paper, scissors game, should we expect that the players will randomize jointly or that they will randomize independently? In general, this is a difficult question, and often it will come down to what we think better captures the dynamics of the interaction that we're aiming to model. There are some cases, like traffic lights, where thinking about a coordination device makes a ton of sense. But in other cases, a shared coordination device may not make a lot of sense. In Bach or Stravinsky, it really only makes sense to talk about this as a game if the players didn't coordinate in advance. If they had coordinated in advance, we just know what concert they're going to go to, and there really isn't a decision-making problem to be studied. And so as part of your process, when you write down a game-theoretic model to understand some interaction, you should be thinking about what solution concept you will use to make predictions, and part of that decision should come down to whether you think it's plausible in the scenario that you're studying for the players to coordinate their actions.